Well, as we've been talking this week about the special relationship that existed between Paul and Timothy, this very dynamic, uh, not just a father-son uh, relationship in a surrogate form, but also it had a spiritual dimension to it, that uh, their hearts had been wedded together, not only as, as friends and uh, as a father-son relationship, um, but they had really begun to feel the same things. I mean, their their value system and the emotions that expressed that were had become like parallels. So that when you listen to Timothy express his heart for the work of the Lord or the ministry or for people in general, you were really seeing the imprint of Paul upon his life, which makes him such a fascinating character. But as Paul talks to the Philippians and saying, I'm going to send Timothy to you, he goes on to explain about Timothy in verse 22. He says, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Now, in the ancient world, sons were trained in the uh, career or the profession of their fathers. They, if you were a bootmaker, you became a bootmaker because that's what your family did. Well, Paul had become an apostle and Timothy had become really formed in that mold as a minister of Jesus Christ. And as, as in many ways, as an evangelist, as a pastor, as a teacher, that he had really not only been trained and disciplined in that by watching and interacting with Paul on an ongoing basis. But Paul goes on to say he has proved himself in that regard, that there's a proficiency, there's a maturity. And at the time of this writing, we're not absolutely sure how, how old Timothy was. I mean, he must have been fairly young in the sense of maybe his early 20s, because later on Paul would say, don't let any man despise you because of your youth. In other words, don't do anything that would prove to them that trusting you and viewing you as mature was a mistake, but rather live and act out in a way that shows the maturity that you actually have acquired in Christ. And even though people may question that maturity, don't get into arguments about it or try to prove them wrong. Just simply live out that maturity and it'll come to its own fruition. One of the things that uh, Solomon said in Proverbs, he says, you know, don't boast about your own self. Let somebody else do it for you. And I think one of the things that is really a, a trap for people is sometimes we, we want to prove to other people that we're uh, good enough or we're worthwhile, we have value. And so we go out of our way. We can overcompensate relationally. And, uh, uh, and, and sadly, it becomes really obvious to other people that you're really kind of compensating uh, for a lack of actually being secure in your own self. So if we become easily angered, if we become reactive, if we become offended because somebody has criticized us and we take it personally, those are all things that, real, that reveal that we're still trying to secure our sense of worth and value in who we are after the flesh rather than trying to rest in the security, the identity that we have in Christ. And so what Paul was saying to the Philippians, he says, you know, uh, I'm sending Timothy because he has demonstrated time and again that he is someone who will accurately represent the gospel of Christ and my heart as an apostle. Now, it's interesting because the word that Paul uses here for having proved himself uh, has a long history. It's This word literally... Uh, it comes from a root word which talks about the smelting of gold, the refining of metals. And uh, basically in the ancient world, when currency was first uh, began to be distributed, people would just basically create a mold and they would pour it into the mold and they might imprint the image of the ruler at that time. So that that's how oftentimes we can date the age of a coin is by the ruler that it's depicting. Remember Jesus holding up a coin and saying, whose picture is it? And they said, Caesar. Then he says, render to Caesar. What is Caesar's? In other words, Caesar literally owned that currency and smelted it and was using it to pay his debts and acquire whatever he wanted to acquire. <clears throat> well, the whole idea was that when they would smelt these, many times they would have these rough edges and they would kind of take a knife and carve off the rough edges. But there came people who saw that they could, you know, enrich themselves by just kind of shaving the edge of the coin a little more than it should be so that they actually were reducing the value of the coin and uh, keeping the extra and yet using it at full value. And then they would take those shavings and they would smelt it. It's kind of like going to the dentist, you know, and they pull out a tooth that has gold in it. And uh, oftentimes they'll just extract the gold themselves and 
gather it up and then sell it and make a little bit of extra money out of it. Others are more honorable and they'll give you your gold tooth. But the whole point is that these individuals uh, really became kind of a, a plague upon the cultures. But there were some men who simply would not cheat. And the word that they used was dokimos. That was the term that they gave for these individuals. They were the dokimos who were honorable. And that's the word that Paul uses or a variation of it is dokome, where he talks about Timothy being having somebody who has been proved to be genuine, proved to be exactly what he is. Now, here's the thing that's really important is that character uh, cannot be known in any way except on an interpersonal level. I mean, um, I, I would say it this way. Well, one, one of the things that media has done is, is it's helped us to get closer to people than we might otherwise. In times past when they had just newspapers or they had you know movie reels that were edited, you could portray somebody as being something different or better than what they were. I mean, many people did not know that Franklin Roosevelt was uh, an invalid, that he was in a wheelchair because they always managed his portrayals in ways that he, he was wasn't revealed to be going around with crutches or in a wheelchair. And so it gave a false sense of, of strength and confidence that they applied to him that they might otherwise not think he possessed simply because he had a physical disability. Uh, of course, today we are uh, hopefully more informed and more aware that that doesn't change the ability of a man or a woman to be able to uh, do great things. But nonetheless, it's only in this day and age when now we have, you know, on the spot, on the moment, uh, video evidence of people. I mean, one of the uh, problems that our current uh, president has is it's becoming increasingly difficult to hide his cognitive disability. And also, the same time, his, his character flaws, that he is a man that I've followed his career since his first run for president back in 1988, um, who has been known as a prevaricator. That is someone who uh, plays fast and loose with the truth. I mean, he he claims to have done things that he had never done and, and uh, oftentimes has plagiarized other people's comments. One of the things that's unfortunate about him and most politicians in this day and age that there are nine words that they are incapable of ever speaking. They can never say, I was wrong, or I am sorry, or please forgive me. Now, I have found that in all relationships, those nine words are critically important to keeping the health and stability of that relationship, that when we've done something wrong, we are able to say, you're right, I was wrong. And then to follow that with, I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm sorry for what I did. If you, any way you want to arrange that combination of phrases is not nearly as important as the fact that you utter those phrases. Well, the point is that we come to find out who people really are as we really kind of do life together with them. And that's why in this day and age where now we're talking about the, the virtual Christian experience where a growing percentage, like 35% of Christians would rather uh, go to church online than actually have to attend, uh, we don't realize that we may be missing out on some things. I think about people who are watching this devotional and you can do this and, and draw conclusions about who I am as a person and hopefully it's positive, uh, although I can't say that I'm without fault. Uh, I guess you already figured that out. But the whole point is that those who live with me, like my wife and my children and other people, they're the ones who really know who I am. The people I work with in my ministry, those are the people who see me on a, on a daily basis, interact with me, they see my decision-making process, and they can really evaluate pretty clearly by how I measure and make decisions what is valuable and important to me and whether that matches up with the scriptures and how they apply to our life. And I think most importantly, though, that when somebody points out, well, is that really living up to the biblical standard, that we can say, oh, you're right, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and I just ask both God and you to forgive me because I was giving place to a, a lesser ambition, if you will, in my mind. So, um, 
as someone once put it, it's who are we, our character is really who we are when no one else is looking at us. And that may be a very difficult question to answer right off the bat because I'm not sure all of us see ourselves with that clarity. Quite honestly, I, I rely upon my, uh, my, my wife, my, my oldest son, my youngest son. I rely upon them the most to tell me what they see in me. Who do you see that I am? Uh, where do you see my strengths and my weaknesses lie? Because they're the ones that have the most intimate knowledge of my day-to-day -day workings. And I think that that's kind of the interesting question when people say, who are you when no one else is looking? My oldest son told me one time that he used to have people when he was growing up in our church who would uh, basically which would ask him, so what's your dad like really at home? And he said it was always puzzling to him because he didn't see any difference between who I was at church and who I was at home. And I'm thankful for that, that there was a consistency. But it's interesting because people almost inherently expect that people are going to be duplicitous because so many people in our world are dupl duplicitous. They aren't who they pretend to be. And I think one of the great works of the Spirit in our life is when he, God can bring who we really are together with who, uh, what other people see. And you can't really do that until you've gone through a certain uh, death to self, if you will. You have to die to something in yourself, this desire to look better than what you do or to uh, reach some kind of celebrity status. And you're just really comfortable in your own skin. And that's what I strive for. That's because I found that I'm, I'm happiest when I'm just being who I am. <laughs> when we start pretending, we start wearing masks. And you know how we've just gone through a whole season of wearing a mask. And remember how uh, stifling that was and how, yeah, distancing that was? Well, don't, some of us, even though we may not be required to wear a mask anymore, can still be living behind masks that have just as devastating an impact upon how we interact with people around us and who we are really. Well, anyway, taking a lot of time, sorry, move on. We'll pick it up tomorrow. Still have some things I wanna talk about, Paul and Timothy's relationships. Have a blessed day and thank you for giving me part of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.